Hi everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about some variations of the link list. Now, before we talk about the variations, let's have a more qualifying name of the link list we've been working with. The link list we've been working with so far has been singly linked. So what do I mean by singly linked? Let me draw it out and explain it as I go. So each one of our nodes in our list has stored a single link. And that single link has been storing the memory address of the next node in the list. The last node stores null for its next pointer. The values we were working with for our little three node list were three, five, and 12. So I'm gonna highlight in yellow the next portion of each node. So this is the singly linked part. There's only a single link in each one of our nodes. And that single link is the next pointer. It stores the memory address of the next node in the list. So some variations of linked lists we're gonna talk about include singly linked lists with a tail pointer in addition to a head pointer, a doubly linked list where every node stores two links, one to the next pointer, one to the next node, and one as a previous pointer pointing to the previous node. And then lastly, we'll talk about circular linked lists where the last node in the list doesn't point to null, it actually points to the first node in the list. So let's start with linked list with a tail pointer. So here I have a singly linked list because every node has a single link storing the memory address of the next node in the sequence. And I can keep track of the whole list just by storing a pointer to the first node. And that's our head pointer right here. So the head pointer stores the memory address of the first node. And anytime we need to access the last node in the list, we have to walk through the entire list. Anytime we traverse the list, that is a linear time complexity algorithm, big O of N. Big O of N is pretty good. I mean, it could be worse. It could be quadratic or exponential. But what we really want is big O of one, constant time complexity, right? That way, no matter how big our list is, we do the same amount of work. So that's where the tail pointer comes in. A tail pointer stores the memory address of the last node in the list. So if we're gonna do a lot of insert at end or delete at end operations, we can convert their time complexities from linear to constant if we store the memory address of the last node in the list via a tail pointer, because then we can just directly access the last node via the tail pointer. So there's a little bit of overhead, of course, with adding a tail pointer. We have to keep the tail pointer up to date, just like we have to keep the head up to date. So anytime we do an insert or a delete, we're gonna have to make sure that the tail pointer gets updated if it needs to get updated. So let's take a look at the code and how we would start going about implementing a link list with a tail pointer. So this is the link list that we were working with in our last couple of videos. You can see that there is a node pointer called head. To start implementing a tail pointer, we would first add a tail pointer. So right below that node pointer for head, we'll have a node pointer for tail. Like I said, this isn't the end, right? We would still need to go to all of our implementations of our operations and make sure that tail is up to date. But once we do that, we can have really fast removals at end and insertions at end of the list. So depending on our application, if we're working a lot with the end of the list, a tail pointer could be beneficial. If we're always working with say the head of the list, like insert at head or remove at head, then we definitely don't need to have that tail pointer. But it can be helpful if we're gonna have a lot of removals and insertions at the end of the list. All right, let's take a look at the next variant I wanna talk about, which is the doubly linked list. So for a doubly linked list, every single node is going to have two links. All right, so as I draw this, you're gonna see I'm gonna have these two rectangles on either side to denote that there are two links in this node. All 
All right, so I'm gonna highlight in yellow our next pointers, okay, because these are our links to go forward in the list. With a doubly linked list, each node also has a prev pointer. So I'll highlight the prev pointer in green. So the prev pointer is going to store the memory address of the previous node in the list, which will allow us to go backwards in the list. So for example, let's take a look at node 12. Node 12's previous node is node 5. So its prev pointer is going to store the memory address of node with value 5. So I'm going to draw a green arrow pointing back from 12 to 5. Now we can get backwards from 12 to 5. Now we're at 5. 5's previous node is the node with value 3. So 5's previous pointer is going to store the memory address of the node with value 3. So I'm going to draw this arrow going back from 5 to 3. Now, what is 3's previous pointer going to store? So 3 is at the front of the list. So it doesn't have a previous node, which means that it's going to point to null. So very much like how our last node in the list points to null because there is no next node, our first node in the list is going to have its prev pointer point to null because there is no previous node in the list. So what are some reasons you might consider using a doubly linked list over a singly linked list? Well, here are a few. One is with previous links, we can go backwards in the list. Imagine if we also had a tail pointer at the end of the list, then we could start at the back and go forward in the list. And we could also start at the beginning and uh, excuse me, we can start at the tail, the end of the list and go backwards in the list, or we can start at the head and go forward in the list. Uh, I think I'm going to re-say that. That wasn't clear, was it? Start over. So what are some reasons that we might use a doubly linked list? Well, let's say we need to be able to go backwards in our list. So if we add a tail pointer to the end of our list, then we can start at the end of the list and move backwards towards the front of the list. Or we can start at the front of the list and move forwards towards the back of the list. So it allows us to move forward and backwards within the list. Also, recall our insert and order and our delete node operations. As part of our traversal code, we had to keep track of the previous pointer so that we could splice a node in or splice a node out of the middle of the list. So we had our prev pointer and our cur pointer that pointed to the previous node and the current node respectively. So now we don't need that traversal code to keep track of its own previous node pointer because with the current node, we can just look at its previous pointer to get the node that comes before it. So let's take a look at how we would start writing code to implement a doubly linked list. We're gonna head up to the node struct and see that it has a pointer to the next node. We're going to add a pointer to the previous node. That's all we need to do to update our node definition. But of course, we would need to go to all of our operations that we implemented and make sure that we properly initialize our node so that its prev pointer is initially null, but it gets updated depending on where it gets inserted into the list. When we remove something from a list, we also need to make sure that we're looking properly at the surrounding nodes to not only update their next pointers, but their previous pointers as well. So we'll have some extra code to write for inserting and removing to make sure that all of the list's previous pointers stay up to date. All right, let's take a look at our last variation here, which is a circular linked list. So I'm gonna draw our little example we've been working with so far again. It'll be singly linked. All right, so this is a singly linked list. We can make this singly linked list be circular by saying the last node in the list doesn't need to point to null 
Instead, it could point to the first node in the list. So I'm going to have 12's next pointer store the memory address of the 3 node. And now I have a circular link list because the list has no end. It's circular. Now, what might be some reasons you would use a circular link list? Well, if you think about it, there's no front of the list anymore, right? Head, right now I have pointing at three, but let's say three just gets processed and we advance head. Head could now say be at five. So if we don't need a start of a list anymore and head could just point to any node in the list, then we can still access all the nodes by traversing through the list. This can be helpful for any kind of actions where you are repeating a set of things you're processing. So think about a playlist, for example. If you have a playlist of songs and you set that playlist to repeat, then let's say head is pointed to the current song that's playing. Once that song is done playing, you advance head to the next song in the list. Once that song is done playing, you advance head to the next song in the list. And once that song is done playing, we've already heard all of the songs, but we're just going to keep going around in a circle playing these songs because the user has specified this playlist should be played on repeat. So there is no front of the list, just the current song being played in the playlist. You can also simulate how an operating system will schedule processes to run on a processor with a circular link list. For example, let's say you have three processes running on your operating system right now. So in a round robin manner, each one of these processes is going to be scheduled to get a little bit of CPU time. There isn't a front of the list, just the current process that's being run in the list and it's a round robin manner. They each get equal time on the CPU and you just keep going around and around. And let's say one of these processes dies, then we remove it from the list and it's no longer scheduled. Let's say the user opens up another process, we'll add it to the list and we'll probably add it either right behind our head, right, our currently executing process or right in front of it so that it's executed either really late or really soon. But the key here with these circular linked list examples is we've got a set of operations or a set of data that we're continually processing and there isn't a front of the list, just where we currently are in the list. How would we implement a circular linked list? Well, we actually wouldn't have to change anything to the code defining our node or our linked list, but we would have to change our operation implementations. So for example, what if there's only one node in the list? Well, if there's only one node in the list, let's say five is the only node in the list, then five is actually going to point to itself. Kind of weird to think about, but we'd have to add in this case to make sure that our circular link list is always up to date. And anytime we add something, say, to the end of the list, we'd have to make sure that its next pointer doesn't point to null it points to the end of the list. Also, how would you know when you've processed every element in the list, right? You have to keep track of where the start of your list is. So I might have something like, say, start pointing at head, and then I could advance head all the way around this list, stopping once head is equal to start, meaning I've processed the entire list and I'm back where I started. All right, there are three variations of the linked list, the singly linked list. We've got circular linked list, doubly linked list, and we have a linked list with a tail pointer. We can combine them, as I kind of alluded to when we were talking about our circular linked list. I added a tail pointer here saying we could start at the end of the list and follow the previous links to get back to the beginning of the list. It all depends on your application, which implementation you would use, because you'd want to be as efficient as possible. And all of these implementations and their various operations have trade-offs in terms of their time complexities in order to implement. All right, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching and feel free to carry on with this video 
by implementing those operations for each one of these variations of our linked list.